So, okay, so our today's speaker is Fiona McFarlane. She is from University of St. Andrews. She works at uh, School of Mathematics and Statistics. And she works with Mark Chaplin. Mark was had his presentation last spring in the same seminar program. Uh, so, so Fiona, her, she got her PhD degree two years ago in uh, 2019, and her PhD was devoted to mass analysis of immune response to cancer, and she did it also with Mark Chaplin. Uh, so today, Fiona will be talking about different kind of modeling approaches to model growing cell populations, as far as I understood. Yeah, so I'm passing it to you, Fiona. <clears throat> Thank you, um, and thanks for the kind invitation. So today, I'm not going to be talking about cancer modeling um, particularly, but more focusing on work that we've been doing over the last couple of years on um, developing models of growing cell populations, and mainly in the context of cell populations where we see patterns forming. So um, I'll start by giving an idea of some of the patterns we might see in cell populations and the mechanisms that we might want to um, look at when we start to model these. We'll look a little bit about the general mathematical modeling framework that um, we've been working with and then look at some example scenarios. So we're gonna look at a case of chemotaxis where cells are moving in response to some chemical. Um, I look at some Turing pattern cases where the cells are responding to some chemicals that form Turing patterns. And look at a case where cells aren't responding to a chemical but instead are responding to a gradient of pressure that the cells produce themselves. So first of all, let's start to think about the types of patterns we might see in um, cell populations. So patterns themselves arise in a wide array of places in nature. So um, I hope you can see my cursor, but we have these vegetation patterns, for example, um, or river patterns where uh, the river goes into the land. We also see patterns in the shape and the structure of plants, for example, or shells. Um, and we obviously see very nice patterns in animal coats. Um, so for example, in snake skin, we get these nice hexagonal patterns. But for today's talk, we're gonna focus on patterns more at a cellular level. Um, so for example, cell sheets, or where we see cells um, pattern from a single cell into this complex organism that we see in um, developmental biology, for example. We also might observe patterns in things like cancer, where we have this growing cell population um, that is invading a tissue, and we might see patterns in the way that that uh, population invades uh, the tissue that it's in. So we want to think a little bit about what kind of mechanisms from a biological standpoint that we might want to include in our mathematical model. Um, and I'm only going to focus on the ones that we're going to include in our model, but there's various other ones that might have play a role in um, the formation of patterns in growing cell populations. So we might want to include model uh, in our model some mechanisms of cell movement. So that could be something like chemotaxis. Um, so chemotaxis is the movement of cells in response to some chemical gradient. So for example, in a chemoattraction case, the cells want to move towards a higher concentration of whatever the chemical is. So biologically, that could be something like a nutrient where the cells want to be somewhere where there's lots of that nutrient. We can also have the opposite where we have chemorepulsion where the cells are likely to move down a gradient of some chemical. So as an example, um, we have this video where cells are responding to cyclic AMP that's being pipetted into a Petri dish. And when you see the cells around this signal all start to move towards it, and even ones that are slightly further away start to recognize this and move towards it. Even when we change where the um, cyclic AMP is being put in, we see the cells, some cells start to change direction to this one, um, but some still move towards this source here. So this is just a nice example of this chemotaxis process 
where the cells are responding to this gradient um, of this chemical. So as well as chemotaxis, we could have cell migration in response to um, physical or mechanical cues. So that could be things like collective cell migration, which could involve things like adhesion where the cells are um, stuck together almost, where the, if one cell moves, the others will follow on because of those forces between. Um, along those lines as well, we could have things like um, pressure dependent movement or repulsion of cells, or just the forces of cells pushing each other um, as they move around in a system. So as a, an example here, um, we have this nice video where they have this cell sheet. Um, let me just run that again. And we see that although the cells are all single cells, they're all moving almost as one um, cell population because of the forces between them. So as well as cell movement, um, some other things that may contribute to uh, patterns that we see in cell biology would be things like cell proliferation. And for the context of today's talk, we're gonna focus on cell proliferation being um, cell division and cell death. So for cell division, that could be in response to some chemical where um, the cells are more likely to divide because of some dependence on some chemicals. So biologically, that could be something like a growth factor. Um, and somewhere that we might see that is in things like cancer. So on this left-hand side, we have a normal epithelium where we have these very well-structured um, epithelial sheets on top of a connective tissue. And we have this very defined boundary between these. Whereas in um, cancer on this final one, in invasive carcinoma, we have something that's not very well structured and we see this invasion into the connective tissue as well. And one of the mechanisms that cancer uses to grow and um, invade into tissue is by increasing their cell division through different growth factors that tumor cells might produce. So as well as um, cell division, we could have cell death, um, which could be in response to chemicals as well. Um, so things like necrosis factors or apoptosis factors that promote cell death, um, or we could have cell death in response to physical cues. So again, this could be from physical contact with other cells causing damage um, or the cells being squashed in some way. So here we see um, apoptosis and epithelial cell sheets. So these white cells were the apoptosing cells, but the apoptosis of a single cell is causing movement of the cells around as well. So with these biological examples from experimental biology, we can see that these mechanisms have um, effects not only on the single cells that are going through these mechanisms, but on the wider population as well. So that's what we want to try and capture in these mathematical models as we want to investigate um, scenarios of uh, pattern formation, where these patterns are arising from um, mechanisms that affect single cells and how that would affect the wider population. So let's start to look at the general mathematical modeling framework. So we want to decide what type of model we want to use in these cases. And generally with cell populations of um, the kind of models we're looking at, there would be two choices. We would either use a kind of computational model, like an agent-based model or an individual-based model, or a continuum model, like partial differential equation models or PDE models. So um, we can kind of compare these models. So individual-based models are um, useful for tracking single cell dynamics. We can also track whole population dynamics with these model types. We can include um, randomness or stochasticity in these models as well. However, they're not generally amenable to mathematical analysis techniques. Um, so we need to run simulations to get an idea of the output of these models, but it's hard to quantify that output. Whereas partial differential equation models, um, generally we don't include single cell dynamics, but they're good for looking at whole population dynamics. Um, generally, unless we look at stochastic PDEs, it's uh, uncommon to include randomness or stochasticity into these models. Uh, but these models are very useful when we're looking at mathematical analysis techniques. So because we want to focus on these single cell dynamics, um, particularly, we're going to be working with individual based models. 
But as we'll see later on, we can um, look at the underlying random walk of these models and derive a continuum model in the form of PDEs, which allows us then to do some mathematical analysis with the models themselves. So let's focus on the individual base models and the general framework that we use um, in this context. So an individual base model, we have to define um, what our agents or individuals are going to be. So in our case, that's going to be each cell within the population and each cell is going to be able to act independently in our um, simulations. Then we have to define the environment of these agents or individuals. Um, and in our context, that's going to be a spatial domain in which the cells reside. And that spatial domain could also include um, chemicals as well. So the spatial domain for an individual based model, we have to define whether that's going to be off lattice or on lattice. Um, so that means if we're going to confine the cells to a grid or not. Um, and for the talk today, we're going to focus on on lattice models um, because that allows us to look at the derivation to the PDE models. We then have to define some rules. So these are going to be um, probability based interactions and properties of the cells in our population. So that's going to include things like interactions between cells um, interactions between cells and their environment, which could be things like um, chemicals or the properties of cells as well. So things like cell movement, cell division and cell death are all going to be probability based in our simulations. So let's start to look at the setup of these individual base models. And the setup I'm going to show is in going to be in 2D. Some of the results that I'll show later are going to be in 1D or 2D, but the ideas are the same in both cases. So as I said, we're going to be on a lattice-based spatial domain. So that means we split up our spatial domain into these um, rectangles where we give each rectangle an index. So this middle square is going to be the index i, j. And we're going to confine each cell to be on one of these um, grid positions. So the cells will always be constrained within um, a grid position. We take delta x to be the width of these grid positions and delta y to be the height of these grid positions. And um, we're going to consider a regular lattice. So that means that each grid has the same width and each grid space has the same height as all the others in the simulations that we're going to show today. So we want to think a little bit about some of the mechanisms we want to include. Um, so one mechanism that we might want to include is undirected or random cell movement. So for each cell at each time step in our simulation, we're going to set a probability of the cell moving to each of the four neighboring positions. Um, so here we just choose these four neighboring positions, although we could choose um, different arrays for that neighborhood. So if we want this to be totally random cell movement, we can just set the probability um, of each of these to be theta over four where theta is some probability of the cell moving at all. So this would be totally random movement. Um, now we can think a little bit about directed cell movement. So this time, again, we're going to have a probability of moving up, um, left, down, or right at each time step for each single cell. But this time we're going to de uh, depend this on something. Um, and we're going to depend this on some gradient. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to set some function lambda and the value of this function lambda is going to be um, something that the cells depend on. So for example, in the context of chemotaxis, this might be a chemical concentration. And for this probability, we take the difference between the value of this function at the neighboring position minus uh, the value of this function at our current position. And here, it depends if we're moving up or down the gradient and what sign we take here. And um, so it's positive if we're moving up the gradient and negative if we're moving down the gradient. And we take the positive part of this whole function to ensure that this probability is always um, positive. 
So as well as this gradient, we have to impose um, this lambda max, which is going to be some scaling factor that ensures that the values of this function um, don't make this probability greater than one. So this lambda max will be whatever the maximum value is um, of this difference between these. Um, and that's just to ensure that this probability is uh, a probability. We also will include some parameter eta that determines how sensitive the cells are to the gradient um, of this function lambda. So don't worry too much about the technical details of this. Um, as we go on, things should become a little bit clearer. So we have these two different forms of cell movement, one which is more random, and then one that can allow us to move up or down a gradient um, of some chemical, for example, or it could be some other gradient. So we now want to think about cell division. Um, so in uh, the models that we're going to look at, we're going to have some probability of each cell dividing at each time step. And when the cell divides, um, it splits into two identical daughter cells. And then for our simulation, what that means is essentially add another cell to the current position that we're in. So we can do that um, multiple times. And um, this probability of the cell dividing, we can write in this term here. So this probability of the cell dividing will depend on some um, parameter alpha that is proportional to the rate of cell division. So that tells us how likely it is that cell is going to divide. We may also have some volume filling function. Um, so here we have five cells in this grid position, but we could impose that we can't have more than five cells in that position um, to make it realistic because of the space that's being filled up. So we take the positive part of this volume filling function which is a function of cell density at each position. And the reason we take the positive part of this is that once we reach some threshold value of the cell density on that position, then this function will become negative. Um, so we won't be able to divide anymore. So as well as this volume filling function, we might have some other dependence function, um, which could be, for example, some dependence on growth factors or chemicals. Um, so this has been left as some generic function phi one for the context of the general framework. So as well as cell division, which could be density dependent um, through this volume filling function, we also could include cell death. So in the simulations, there's going to be some probability of cell death for every cell at every time step. And that probability, if the cell dies, it's just removed from the system immediately. And we take the probability um, of cell death to be of this form here. So this first term comes from the um, cell division, where this is now the negative part of that volume filling function. So if the cell number um, or cell density in a position is higher than the threshold value, then we're going to impose um, cell death to ensure that the cells will eventually become lower than that threshold value again. As well as this um, volume filling imposed cell death, there may also be additional cell death where we could consider some um, parameter beta, which determines how likely it is for cells to die. And again, there could be some dependence on cell death um, on some chemicals, for example. So again, we could have a generic function by two which uh, determines cell death. So as well as these mechanisms of the cells, we may also want to include things like chemicals on the lattice. So with these individual waste models, instead of considering um, each individual molecule of the cell, uh, of the chemical, we can consider just the concentration of some chemical. So by doing that, what we're essentially doing is um, solving a PDE or a deterministic equation for the local concentration of each chemical at each position on the grid. So in the models, we're going to consider um, any chemicals to be modeled through uh, discrete PDEs. So although there can be stochasticity in the cell dynamics, the chemicals are going to be modeled deterministically. <clears throat> 
So I'm not gonna to spend too long on um, this part, but with these individual base models, what we can do is we can derive the continuum limit by looking at the underlying random walk of these um, generic individual base models. So I've split this up into the three different terms, but we can write out the underlying random walk um, for the cell density in at each position i at each time step um, k and look at what happens at the time step k plus one. So this uh, derivation is in 1D, but the same principles hold in 2D. So for example, for random motion, the cell density at the next time step is going to depend on what it was before plus the cells moving in from the right-hand position through this random motion, the cells moving in from the left-hand position through random motion, minus the cells that are going to move out of the current position due to random motion. And in the same way, we can write out the terms for directed motion. So this time the motion is gonna depend on this gradient of lambda. Um, and again, we would have cells moving in through this um, process and cells moving out through this process. For our cell division and cell death, um, for the models that we choose, we choose these to be local interactions. So that means that we'll have some, um, these functions of cell division and cell death, but these will all just depend on the density at the current position and won't involve any cells moving in or out. So with these um, now discrete equations, what we can do is we can look for the continuum limit of this by scaling I don't know what happened there. Can everyone see my screen again? Yes. Yes, okay. you're back. Yeah. I don't know how much you missed, but we'll just go from uh, here. About halfway through, yeah. So the directed motion, we end up with terms like this, where we have this gradient um, of n times the gradient of the, whatever the, uh, the lambda function is. And uh, with our cell division and death, we end up with terms in the continuum limit that look like this. So what we have is we have this um, very generic framework that allows us to describe these stochastic interactions of single cells in a wider population of cells. And we can easily adapt these to include different movement and proliferation mechanisms of the cells at the single cell level. Um, and we can include things like chemical dependence, where generally we're going to model these chemicals uh, deterministically. And in the cases we're going to look at, we can also derive the continuum limits to let us to do some mathematical analysis. So we're going to look at So the first example we're going to look at is a case of chemotaxis. So we're going to consider that we have some cell population um, N, and we're going to allow two forms of cell movement of this cell population. So we're going to allow a almost random movement, but there's going to be some density dependence. Um, so instead of having density dependence in the cell proliferation terms, in this case, we're going to ensure that cells, there's free space in the um, neighboring positions for the cells to move into them. But that's going to still be an almost random movement um, in that case. We're also going to consider directed cell movement in this case, which is going to also be density dependent and depend on the gradient of some chemoattractant C. In this case, we're not going to look at any cell division and death, so we're only going to look at the movement of the cell population 
and we've got this chemoattractant C, and this chemoattractant is going to be produced by the cells, is going to decay, and is going to diffuse in our spatial domain. So the discrete equations for this, um, these are all similar terms to what we've seen before, but we have our cell density N, and um, this is the underlying random walk of the individual base model, where we've got this density dependent random motion. So we've got something um, where we've got these functions of cell density that determine if a cell can move into position. We've also got cells moving via chemotaxis, um, which is also density dependent and is also dependent on this gradient of C. So in this case, the cells are moving up the gradient of C that they want to be in areas with a high concentration. Um, with our chemical C, we have this um, discrete form of diffusion and we've got some production that's dependent on the cells and some natural decay of our chemoattractant. So for our volume filling function, we have some um, N bar that is a threshold value such that when um, the cell density gets to this N bar, this volume filling function is zero. So this just ensures that cells are not moving into an area that's got too many cells in it already. So when we do the continuum limit for these, um, as we've seen before, we end up with this system of PDEs where we have this nonlinear diffusion term and we have this um, density-dependent chemotaxis of the cells. With the chemotractant, we have diffusion, um, production, and decay. So for those who are familiar with chemotaxis equations, this is a form of the pat or siegel model where volume filling effects have been taken into account, um, where we could set our nonlinear diffusion term to be of this form. Um, so the part inside the brackets could become dn. So this is quite nice that we've been able to recover something that is well known and well studied by from the first principles of the individual based model. So let's look at some example results to get an idea of the kind of things that we can investigate with these models. So one thing um, that we might want to consider is do we start to see patterns of these of the cell population from the individual cell level? So from the individual base model, do we see patterns arising? And we might also want to ask, do we get a good match between the individual base model and the corresponding PDE models that we derived? So let's look at a 1D situation um, to start with. So this top row is the cell density um, at five different time steps and the bottom row is our chemical concentration. So the solid colored line um, is the individual base model results and the dashed line is the corresponding continuum model. And the individual base model is an average of five runs of the simulation. So remember a lot of the um, mechanisms are probability based. So we would expect some stochasticity. Um, so that means that the results are not always going to be um, exactly the same so we take an average of this to get a good idea of what's going on. So we start out with a um, almost uniform cell density to start with. And then over time, we see these peaks of cell density start to form. Um, and then we end up with these two peaks that merge together to form this single peak on the left. And we have this other peak on the right. And we see that from D to E, there's no change. So these patterns stabilize in this case. So we do indeed see this um, patterning where the cells are following this chemical, but we end up in a situation where we have a stable pattern. We also, um, in this case, get a very good match between the individual base model and the PDE model. So we can also look, um, this was the 1D case, we can also look at 2D simulations. So the top row is the individual base model, so the stochastic model and the bottom row is the corresponding PDE model. Um, so we have three time steps at A, B, and C, and then D is the final time step, but rotated. So in this case, um, we've got a top-down view, so we're looking at uh, four peaks of cell density, and then we see these peaks start to merge together 
and we end up with this single um, peak in the middle. And when we rotate this, we can see that we have this flat top um, on top of this peak. So we can start to see the volume filling effects uh, take, uh, taken into account in this case, where the cells have been restricted on how many cells can be on each position. So we see that in this case, generally the PDE model and the individual base model, there are some slight differences, but um, overall they're not too bad at matching each other as well. So we might also want to think, are there going to be situations where the individual base model and the continuum model don't match? Um, so one context that we can look at is what happens when we have very low cell numbers um, in our system. So this time we're looking at um, four different parameter settings. So um, we're starting out where we have the initial number of cells or the initial cell density on each position being 10 to the five in case A and going all the way down to 10 to the two in case D. So again, the individual base model is this darker solid line um, where each run of the individual base model are these pale blue lines behind. And the PDE model are the dashed lines. So we see for this first case, um, we get an okay match for this peak, but there's slight variation in the individual base model in the position of this peak here. Um, whereas in the PDE model, we don't capture that variation. And as we go further down, um, we end up with a worse and worse approximation by the PDE of what's happening at the individual base model level. So we see this increased stochasticity means that the PDE is not quite capturing what's happening at the single cell level. So in those contexts, it might be more useful to look at the individual base model than a PDE model in those cases. So what I've not shown for this chemotaxis case is we looked at um, some analysis for this. So we looked at linear stability analysis of the corresponding PDE model. And we also looked at what happens when we vary some parameters. So things like the sensitivity of the cells to some chemical, uh, to the chemical. And we also looked at the limit where the volume filling function tended to one, which is um, convergence to the classical pat like kaler siegel model in the PDE. But to move on, let's look at, um, I wanted to give an overview of a few different cases. So let's look at a second case. Um, let's look at what happens if we model something where we've got Turing patterns. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to consider we have two chemical populations, U and V, and they're going to interact via Turing mechanisms. So that means there's going to be some reaction diffusion equations for U and V where um, the interaction between U and V results in these stable patterns forming. As well as the chemicals U and V, we're then gonna have a cell population N, which responds to chemical U and V. Um, and it's going to respond either through some sort of chemotaxis or through its cell proliferation mechanisms. So in this case, we're gonna look at two scenarios. We're gonna look at um, one scenario where we have chemically dependent proliferation. Uh, so that means that we're going to have um, random movement of the cells, but chemically dependent proliferation and the two chemicals through this uh, Turing mechanism. And the second scenario we're going to look at is a chemotaxis case where we've got chemicals U and V. Um, we've got the chemotaxis of the cells, but this time we've just got normal cell proliferation. So what we want to do with this case is look at what um, the patterns look like when we uh, allow the cells to react to the chemical in different ways. So this one's a little bit more complicated when we look at the underlying random walk. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail for this, but we have these forms where we have the um, discrete equations for U and V, where we have this discrete form of diffusion plus um, local interaction terms between U and V. Then for our cell population, we have some probability of birth and probability of death, which are given by these terms here, which have volume filling effects and have some dependence on chemicals U and chemicals V. Uh, 
We're also going to potentially allow some chemotaxis or directed motion um, for the cells, and that's going to depend on the concentration of the chemical U if we include that. So again, we can do the continuum limit of these. And when we do that, we end up with this system of PDEs where we have um, reaction diffusion equations for U and V. And for a cell population, we have some um, diffusion-like terms, some chemotaxis, and then these local um, cell division and death terms. And for the models, we set Schneckenberg kinetics for the chemicals U and V um, to ensure that we do get Turing patterns. We have some linear form for the uh, volume filling function, and we have some linear form for the chemical dependence on proliferation for the cells, if that's included. So we can look at the 2D results for this. Um, so what we're going to have is we've got X and Y are two spatial domain um, parameters or um, variables. Then we're going to have the concentration of chemical U in this pattern in this panel, the concentration of our chemical V in this panel. Then we're going to look at the individual base model where we allow cells to respond to the chemicals through their um, division and death in this panel um, and the corresponding PDE in the panel below. And then in the chemotaxis case, we've got the individual base model where cells are responding to the chemicals through chemotaxis and the PDE model in the bottom panel. So we can run these simulations. Um, and as we see in this video, our chemicals U uh, and V, we end up in chemical U with these target-like spots um, through the uh, reactions between U and V. However, the way that we see the patterns in the cell density depends on how the cells respond to that chemical. So in the proliferation case, we have these very fat um, fuzzy spots where the um, cell density around the, concentra the high concentrations of U, we see these um, wider spots. Whereas in the chemotaxis case, we have these very um, small uh, peaks of density, which are, if we look very closely, more like the target pattern, whereas we kind of lose the target shape in the proliferation case. So here we see that the um, mechanism that the cells are responding to the chemicals can impact what kinds of patterns we see. Um, and in this case, we see also we get a good match between the individual based and the PDE models for these cases, although we do see more stochasticity in the individual based model results. So one thing we can do with um, these ones as well is we've looked at what happens if we allow the domain to grow. So if we start out with um, this stable pattern um, that's, uh, and then we let the domain grow after we've got this stable pattern, we can look at those results. Um, so this is the case where uh, the, I'll just run that again. This is the case where the domain is growing uniformly. So each position is growing at the same rate. And we saw in this case that the pattern splits in all cases. Um, and again, we get this good match between the individual based model and the PD model. Although there is some, um, a bit more randomness around the boundaries in this case. With the chemotaxis case as well, um, the, small, the spots are a little bit harder to see in the individual base model. Um, so there's a bit more randomness there as well. We could also look at what happens if we let the domain grow in one um, uh, apically. So we're letting one corner of the domain grow only. Um, so we were on the simulations this time. We see that the domain is stretching, but the pattern stretches and then splits and we get um, these smaller spots forming as well. So with these results, um, we can get, we can investigate different scenarios uh, of um, what we might expect to see in growing organisms, for example. So what I've not shown with the Turing pattern stuff is um, there's other cases where we don't get a good match between the individual base model and the PDE model. So again, that's things like when we have low um, cell densities or if we have more stochasticity in the system. So for example, if our cell death rate is closer 
or our cell death probability is closer to cell division probabilities, then um, that results in a bit more stochasticity in the system, which means that the PDE isn't able to capture those dynamics. What I've also not shown is the derivation of the continuum limit in the growing domain cases um, from the underlying random walk. So that gets a little bit more complex when we have to take into account the fact that our domain um, is growing. So I want to finish with one final example um, where instead of cells responding to some chemical, they're going to be responding to some pressure gradient where the pressure gradient is something that's produced um, through the cells. So it's going to be density, density dependent. So we're going to consider this time that we have two cell populations, um, population M and population N, where their cell movement is going to be dependent on moving down a gradient of pressure P. So what that means is that the cells essentially want to move from an area where they're going to feel constrained and move to an area where there's going to be less um, cells or less pressure from other cells. And we're also going to have it that the cell division and cell death is also going to be dependent on some pressure function G, where cells are more likely to die if there's um, a high number of other cells close by to them. So in this case, um, again, the discrete equations are a little bit more complex. Uh, so for our chemical, uh, for our cell density N, we're going to have this um, cells moving in through this pressure dependent movement function, where now we're looking at the gradient of the pressure is what the cells are moving down. We also have some division and death terms dependent on this pressure function GN which is going to be specific for um, the cells in population N. Our population M similarly is also going to be moving down this pressure gradient um, where there could be a different sensitivity of the cells uh, from N and M. And again, there might be division and death in those cases. And our pressure is defined as a function of the total cell density. So it'll be dependent on the density of N plus the density of M in each position. So we can do the um, continuum limit as before, and we end up with these PDEs here, where we have the um, difference in N over time is going to depend on this uh, gradient of N times the pressure gradient plus these growth terms. Um, for our population M, we have the same, but we'll have different parameters. And our pressure, again, is a function of total cell density. So the results I'm going to show today, we're going to look at a case where we set the second population to be a non-growing population. So that means we're going to have a population that is moving and um, dividing, which is a population N, and in a population that can just move. Um, so what that could look like in a biological context, for example, is having um, some population that's invasive and a population that's in homeostasis where cell division and cell death are equal. So um, my previous work has been in cancer. So it could be, for example, having a cancer cell population given by population N um, and some tissue level population given by M where we don't expect there to be lots of cell division and death. So we can start to look at simulations for this. So these are going to be 1D simulations. And we're first of all going to look at the case where the um, sensitivity to the pressure gradient in movement for chemical uh, for cell population N is greater than that of cell population M. So um, in the plots, we're going to have the um, individual base model result of N in red and the individual base model result for M in blue, with the PDE uh, being the dashed line on top of that, the black dashed line. On the left, we're gonna have the total pressure. So again, this now is gonna be some function of M plus N. And in this case, we take this to be some power law function. So we can run these simulations over time. And we see in this case, um, the population N, which is our population that's allowed to divide and grow, 
overtakes and there's some spatial mixing where we have M and N in the same positions. And then we have just the population N then continues to move. So in the pressure, we have this traveling wave um, of pressure from the left to the right. And we have done traveling wave analysis for these models as well. But what's interesting is if we um, look at a different case, so if we look at the case where the um, population M is more sensitive, it is, yeah, is more sensitive to the pressure gradient in its movement, then we see something a little bit different. So this time, when we run the simulations, we see that there's not spatial mixing of the two populations, and instead there's a segregation of populations, where population N is essentially pushing along um, population M. And in the pressure, we see this um, kink in the pressure where we have this discontinuous jump between um, the two populations. We can also look at this in the 2D setting. So this is fairly recent results um, where what we're plotting here is the individual base model results for just the cell population N. So that's the growing population. And in this case, we start out with a small number of population N in the center at zero, zero, and allow them then to grow and move. Um, so we see that in this first case, we have this radial growth where population N is just um, fairly evenly moving out into the domain. So in this domain where it's blue, there will be population M. So that was in the 1D case, the context where the cells were being pushed along. Whereas in this other case where we saw um, mixing in the 1D setting, we have this um, structure forming where we have Firstly, radial growth of population N, and then we have these um, finger-like protrusions starting to form, and then we even see splitting of these fingers over time as the population branches out into population M um, area. So what's interesting about these patterns is we start to see patterns like this um, finger-like pattern in things like uh, breast cancer invasion into adipose tissue. So again, this could be something that relates to something in that biological context. So for this pressure case, um, again, I didn't really show cases where the individual base model and continuum limit do not match, but we have investigated those. We've also done traveling wave analysis. Um, we've looked at the case where we just have a single population reacting to its own pressure gradient. And we've looked at different pressure functions as well, instead of using this power law function. So just to recap, um, we've looked, we've developed a relatively simple agent-based framework that captures single cell dynamics in cell populations and um, that allow us to see patterns arising uh, at the whole cell population level. We've looked at deriving the continuum limit in those to allow for comparison and analysis. And we've considered some example scenarios. Um, so with this framework, we can obviously include many more complex mechanisms. And um, the hope is also to apply some of these models to uh, bio more biologically relevant scenarios and looking at applying um, physical data to these models as well. So this was all joint work. Um, so the chemotaxis model was joint with um, Federica Buba, who's sadly no longer with us, um, and Tommaso Lorenzi in Torino. And the pressure and Turing pattern models were with Mark Chaplin and St. Andrews and also with Tommaso Lorenzi. Um, so if you are interested in any of these models, you can look at each scenario is its own paper. So we have this Cubitexas paper um, in the Proceedings of Royal Society A. The Turing pattern paper is in Mathematical Biosciences and Engineering. And the pressure scenario was in the Journal of Mathematical Biology or feel free to get in touch if you have any um, questions on this area. But thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks Fiona, it's a very interesting talk. Uh, so it's time for question. So anyone, can you raise your hand if you have a question? Okay, so Natasha. Yeah, um, I got a question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to turn my camera on. <laughs> Okay, we can hear you anyway. Yeah. You can hear me. 
Okay, so um, in the initial slides, there was pictures, I think it was chemotaxis in one dimension, and then chemotaxis in two dimensions. You can, and you, you started off with two little peaks at the end of the one dimensional thing, and then you ended up with three peaks, essentially. Uh, no, two. I was just wondering, because you said that was chemotaxis, I was just wondering where the gradient was. I don't know if I missed it. Because in the two-dimensional case, all the cells move to a central location. So, yeah, sorry, I maybe wasn't clear on that. Um, so the chemical gradient was plotted underneath, but in those cases, the cells were producing the chemoattractant that they were oh. then following. Um, so that's why you get this kind of uh, aggregation of them because where there's more cells, there's like yeah, people. That makes sense now. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> uh, Richard? Funnily enough, I did, actually have a, I did enjoy that. I had a similar question, but I've got another question which is probably a little bit more difficult to answer. And that is if you're comparing these kind of two, you know, different types of models, one which is essentially stochastic and one which is essentially differential, equation based and you want to kind of say your stochastics are better I mean I have to state before I before I ask this question properly that I very much believe in the stochastic approach to these things and I always try and do stochastic models where I possibly can how, how can you sort of demonstrate that it isn't just that your your differential model could be better so I mean from the models we've shown in definitely in the large population case, there's no difference. And in those contexts, it's probably better to use a differential equation because they're less computationally expensive. Um, whereas in the case where we've got more stochasticity or the low cells, then in those contexts, it might be more beneficial to look at stochastic model. So one thing we've been thinking about lately is maybe having something that's a bit more hybrid. So I don't know if you're familiar, but Kit Yates and others have been working on models where you have almost a hybrid model that in the large population areas, it will be a PDE and then you switch to a stochastic model or a discrete model. So for example, in a traveling wave case at the front, you would maybe have um, the discrete model where things are a bit more stochastic, but once the cells are past that front, um, it will be a PDE. But I just, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that is a good, you know, that's a good approach. And certainly I've got some models which do that type of thing. But I just wondered if you literally thought about whether there was a way, if you were, I mean, unless you, you're you being completely non-judgmental about it, if you see what I mean, whether there was a way that you've thought about of actually trying to demonstrate one is, you know, uh, more accurate than the other, given that, of course, you can't know the complete set of either types of models. So perhaps not, perhaps you're not necessarily saying that the models are better no i think in different situations there's benefits and drawbacks to both and um, one thing i would say though is i think by doing the derivation to the pde it's maybe slightly easier to explain to biologists and non-mathematicians where the terms from the pde come from where the stochastic model is maybe slightly easier to be like the cells have a probability of moving um, and yeah. Whereas we get those terms in the PDE, then you can use the PDE without it being questioned as much. I have to say, I mean, I'm asking from the, from the perspective that when you try and publish a model which is different to a model which is already exists, people quite often say, oh, there's already a way of doing that. Mm -hmm. And um, and you kind of want to come back and kind of go, oh, yeah, but ours is better. And really, ultimately, you can only really see ours is different, I suppose. That's the, the point. OK, thank you very much. I enjoyed that. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Fiona, uh, Andy Dean uh, typed his question. How many cells were allowed in each lattice point, he asks. And how sensitive are the two formulations to this? Um, so it depends which model. You can go to slide 23, maybe if you illustrate it on slide 23. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for example, these 10 eyes, what, yeah, it's, it's 10 to the 5 is on each position. There's 10 to the 5 cells allowed. In on each grid point. In each, yeah. yeah. So the, the case before, I think, was 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7 cells allowed on each position. So it's quite high cell numbers um, in those cases. 
Okay, so this makes it closer to continuum model, obviously. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so in your three variable model, U and V2 chemicals, they don't depend on density of, of your population of cells. So there is only one way, yeah, influence. Yeah, so in the Turing pattern model, the chemicals U and V are almost independent of the cell density. Um, it's just a one-way dependence. So it's um, the idea behind that was just that there would be some underlying pattern that the cells are responding to and not contributing to. But um, we could make it more, we could easily adapt that so that the cells are producing chemical U, for example, or chemical. Oh, well, it, it makes sense. It's, so you checked yeah. how chemotaxis and cell proliferation uh, influence by the same background pattern, what they do to population, it, it, it's good. So, yeah, question. the main the mechanisms we chose for that one were based on um, previous mathematical models in the area. So we kind of copied what they did, um, but from the individual based model side. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, more questions? One last question from my side. So it is about slide, one of the latest slides, 43, when you have a pressure. So here I see this underlying structure in growing population. Yeah. You didn't talk about this, how it forms. You see this red uh, stripes. Yeah. This, it cool. is, it's something interesting. I think it is quite interesting story here, uh, which you didn't talk at all. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, yeah, maybe I wasn't super clear on this. So in the 1D case, this would be the same as um, the case where we saw mixing of the two populations. So this case here, um, where we see some mixing of the two populations, but there's some areas where uh, the cells are not able to mix. So we have a slightly higher density of population M than population N. So we get this kind of, because of the pressure gradient, the cells, there's easier paths for the cells to go through. Um, and that's why we get these finger-like patterns rather than the, um, the radial growth that we saw in this case. Um, I think understanding how they form these fingers is quite an interesting problem by itself. Yeah, I mean, this, this work, we're actually still working on the 2D case um, at the moment. And interestingly, the PDE does not match as well um, in some of these cases. But yeah, we're still trying to really understand what's going on here. But it's just the interesting thing is all the only mechanisms we have in here is just the two cell populations moving together. So it's something very simple that causes these complex patterns. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something we're still trying to explain a little bit in more detail about how these will farm. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Uh, thanks again, Fiona. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I think we all enjoyed this. <laughs>